focus in on most critical assets, the largest feeders, and those assets that get the, the best bang for the buck, if you will, uh, the largest volume of customers up in the shortest period of time. And we're reaching the point now where we expect to uh, be in what I describe as a hand-to-hand -hand combat element of it, which is really one truck and one service into one home. And so we're just nearing that point now. You may recall I, I predicted earlier this week that that would be something like 50,000 customers when we got to the end of uh, the large feeder and the work that we had ahead of us. And so we have 54,000 customers remaining at this point, uh, but most of the assets of the large uh, feeders and stations are up and running. As you've heard from the mayor, we are experiencing additional outages as we speak. All of those feeders were put back on overnight, but obviously they affected our ability to restore uh, power to, to others that had experienced it from the storm. And so we now are focusing our efforts largely in the Scarborough area, as most of the West is now complete. I want to uh, do a couple of things with you. I'd like to, first of all, thank my customers for their unbelievable support and their patience. I know they, they we enter into day five here, and we understand the impacts of this had to lives. So we're at, really at the point where, that we've been talking about uh, since Sunday, where we would have a uh, truck attend a residence and uh, clear the debris uh, with the help of city staff. And I must say, I've been asked about the coordination effort. The coordination has been uh, superb, absolutely superb. The, the, we really tagged our, our teams up uh, with the forestry team from the city. And so they now go ahead of us and help clear the, 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 uh, the tree branches and the trees that are down exposing the power lines that are there, and our, tro our, our troops come along behind that and, um, and restore power service to those homes. And so that's the effort we're now at. So as I've been cautioning, while we've seen ourselves go from 300,000 to you know, 100,000 a day, uh, this last bit is going to be a lot of heavy lifting. It will be one truck and one service line. And so we will see a much slower pace as we complete the final restoration efforts the, the last eight. Anthony, you did touch on. You know, we continue to, to be unable to give timelines uh, for two reasons. One, we're experiencing damage as we speak with heavy winds that have been uh, uh, compromised by the ice, and now you're getting snow landing on them, and so we have damage happening this morning. And so the, the scope of the work continues to grow, and there still is a lot of unknown uh, work. We haven't been in every street yet by any means. We've been concentrating all of our resources on making the system was safe. In other words, lines that were down uh, were, were de-energized and they, were, they didn't represent a risk to the, to the public, and then restoring these main lines. That's, the, that's been our effort. And so we haven't been going up and down each street and saying, okay, I've got 10 service lines on this street that need to be closed. 
put up once we get into the communities. I think we'll get a, a much better feel for it, but uh, you know we can't predict yet how much more damage will be done as a result of these compromised trees. Anthony, you did touch on the electricians receiving calls <coughs> in regards to um, people trying to get repairs before hydro can get there. Can you just reiterate your concerns with people phoning electricians before hydro crews get a chance to get yeah, there? So if a homeowner sees that their stand pipe is bent over and under, has been compromised as a result of a tree falling in their yard, uh, that, that's their responsibility to uh, have that repaired uh, before Toronto Hydro can restore power to that home. Uh, we spoke yesterday about an experience of one of our crews the night before where they had restored power to, a, to, to the block and had to unfortunately tell the homeowner that they had to disconnect them because their line to their home represented an unsafe condition. And that we, the last thing we want is somebody to be injured by restoring power. And so um, then the homeowner, there's a process we leave material behind situations when we got there, and clearly the work hadn't been done by qualified people, and we unfortunately had to tell the homeowner that um, that we weren't able to restore power and service to them. Some people have noticed one thing. What has been the effect of the snow? Is it just slowing work down, or is that knocking out power? No, it's knocking out power. We had some large branches come down on the feeders. Remember yesterday, the day before I reported, all feeders were back up. We had some out on the west side uh, go out overnight with branch damage, and, uh, and that's just at the feeder level. So, but uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't get the up and the down, if you will. What I can tell you is, uh, four feeders overnight in the west, they tend to, you know, they tend to have uh, a few thousand customers per feeder. So there may have, in fact, been a, a small blip that occurred, but, um, but it, it, you know, they were, they were remedied fairly, fairly quickly, and so uh, the fifty, they are fixed already. Some people in the city um, have been wondering why they don't have power, while the community next to them, or maybe someone a few blocks away does. Yeah. Can you speak to that and, and how that works? Yeah, I have heard um, those comments back. I think it's important to recognize that we don't distinguish between communities or between different classes of customers. What we've been doing is following a logical path to restore the power in the shortest possible time. I've described it, I think, in terms of the strategy around that with making it safe and fixing the largest feeders first because they bring on thousands of customers. We don't say, well, we need to have truck in every community or two trucks in every community, we really follow the electrical grid and we're agnostic as to um, the community that it happens to affect because no doubt next time it will be in somebody else's community and so we want to make sure that we follow a logical operating strategy to get the power on to the most number of people in the shortest period of time. Can you address the number of calls that we're receiving? Yeah, we're seeing a ratio of about um, Sunday when we, when we had the maximum number of customers out, we had about 300,000 customers out, we had 128,000 calls that day uh, that were attempted. Uh, obviously they didn't get through because we have, as the mayor said, much less capacity. Um, and today we have, as you've heard, 54,000 customers out, and yesterday we had 38,000 uh, calls. Uh, I think yesterday's numbers were around 70,000 customers were out at the time. So you see this ratio of about, about um, one call talk about that a little bit. Um, you know, we, we are aware of the outages, I think is the first point. Uh, you know, we're aware that people are out. Um, but if people, the, the calls that would be most helpful, if we could make the, those lines available for people where power has been restored on their street, and they haven't been, in other words, there's been some damage either in their home or, in, you know, that we did not detect at the time that we were there, uh, that would be very valuable for us to know that. All, uh, when, when your power's been out, it hasn't been restored, and it's, we're aware 
empirical data is so, but I can understand people's frustration by wanting to call each day to ensure that we know, uh, but I want to give people confidence that we know your power is out. And so, um, so with our technologies, we're able to ping meters and other things. And so as we get down through the grid, we get a bet much better profile of exact streets that are out um, that we reconnect the, will, the, the, the communication path to that meter. We now have the capacity for smart meter technologies to ping it and it sends a message back whether it's a, a live or energized or not. And so we also have pretty good numbers. The actual number, I think, is 54,335 customers or something. I mean, we really do have a level of granularity and a visual into, um, in, in, into the specific numbers. Do you have anything to say to people who are sort of reluctant to use their homes for a variety of reasons, tax children? Yeah, I, I, I'm certainly not an expert on it. What we are, we are obviously aware that you know, the lives are being affected here. Um, I, I did want to say that we, within our computer systems, are aware of customers that have uh, mechan or, uh, medical equipment in their homes in particular, and we ping those meters and we provided emergency services, those addresses, and it's my understanding they are already dispatching people to those homes to ensure uh, that they're, they are, in fact, safe. You've already you've heard from city housing and others where we've had people going to doors. So, um, so the, the, the most vulnerable and the ones that, that, that are maybe in their homes uh, are being, in fact, visited, uh, but that's outside of my, you know, my expertise. What I can say is that I appreciate people's patience. I really do. I understand the uh, inconvenience to your lives when, when power is out. Is this the longest, longest outage that Toronto Hydro has seen? Uh, it's actually not. Um, our, our outage records are actually better and better each year. It wasn't it, that long ago where we had windstorms even in the last five years where customers were out uh, almost this period of time with nowhere near this kind of damage on a, on a global scale. So um, we're, you know, we're, we're reaching the outer limits, no doubt, but we certainly have had uh, major events in our history. What is the record then for outages? I'm not sure I can, I can I have it. I just don't have it off the top of my head. I, I'll, I'll make a, a point to find out. What and what lessons has Toronto Hydro learned from this storm? Well, I, I think the first lesson is there's been great success. 82% uh, of the customers are back on already. Um, this, this obviously was a you know, weather event. It was an equipment-based event. And so um, what we you know, maybe worth mentioning is we have been doing weather uh, strategies for uh, almost a decade. It's interesting what didn't come down. Uh, there were an awful lot of lines around town that were, in fact, uh, maintained service. Branches or heavy objects are actually on those lines. That is really a result of us hardening our system, we call it, where we've been using something called tree cable. So it's not just the, the electrical system, it's actually a reinforced electrical system with reinforced connectors onto the poles. And so look around in the air and you'll see many, many places where the benefit of that experience has actually played itself out. It would have been much worse had we not invested in those kind of technologies over the last decade. So you had well, Toronto Hydro has in the past asked for rate increases because of the infrastructure in the city has simply not up to snuff. Does this prove your point? What's happening? It, it has absolutely nothing to do with uh, our, our our infrastructure, um, aging infrastructure issue. This has got everything to do with a weather event in the proximity of a of a tree with an overhead line. It it, it, it could be a line that was 50 years old, or it may be a line that is one year old. Uh, it's got nothing. To Pattern, like Mr. Haynes saying, there wasn't a pattern across the city. So 